Good evening, everyone. Um, and it's really, really good to be here for the second weekend of LitFest. I'm Julie Bell. I'm um, the chair of the trustee board for LitFest. And I'm delighted to welcome you this evening. We nearly got almost a full house because there's a few more people to come, I think. So um, you're here this evening to listen to the lovely Josephine Quinn, who's extremely been extremely busy today. So she's she's flown practically in <laughs> through the door from Oxford. We're really, really grateful to you to fit, for fitting you into our, our ske your schedule to be here for LitFest tonight. Um, just to say, we couldn't actually do this event if we weren't supported by the National um, Heritage Lottery, who helped support this event, and Lancaster City Council. So um, I'll be coming back later to give you a few more details about how we actually make LitFest work. But without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Josephine and Bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's really exciting uh, to be here. It's exciting to see so many people um, here uh, for a history talk on a chilly night. Um, so I thought, I mean, I think what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to talk for a little bit about the book and then we're going to talk to each other, Bill and I, um, about the book and there'll be some Q&A as well. So I'll just talk at the beginning for maybe about 20 minutes about some um, kind of the frame of the book. Um, because uh, so I started out on this project as a classics professor at Oxford, wanting to question the stereotypical role of Greece and Rome in ideas about Western civilization, the idea that the Greeks and Romans are the roots um, of Western civilization. Um, not, not least because I was reading a much bigger and more interesting story than that in the Greek and Roman authors themselves, who are frequently admit their cultural debts to the Egyptians, to the Phoenicians, to all sorts of people. Um, and they also celebrate their connections in the present with other peoples, whether it's about alliances um, or about inventing um, relationships and um, familial connections or family trees um, for themselves, for their kings, for their heroes, sometimes with people who really exist, like the Phrygians or the Lydians, and sometimes with people who, as far as we know, didn't really exist, like the Amazons, people like that. So that was really what I, I, I started this project thinking about. And it comes in that sense out of about 20 years worth, really, of conversations with colleagues, students, applicants, as I talk about in my introduction. Um, but as I actually start to write it, um, I realise that the persistence of this idea of Greco-Roman origins, with or without a dose of the Bible stirred in, um, it's kind of a symptom of a larger phenomenon, even problem. And this is what became the real target of the book as I was writing it. And this is something that I call civilizational thinking. Um, civilizations, you see, might seem like a really natural way to talk about history. But what I realized as I was writing this is that they're a modern concept. Um, invented essentially to explain the superior, invented by, I should say, European intellectuals to explain the superiority of Europe and European nations and to justify their empires. So one thing that I was really surprised to find early uh, on when I was um, researching this book was that the noun civilization, the singular noun, the abstract idea of civilization, only appears in the 18th century, in the mid-18th century for the first time. And it comes out of a sort of enlightenment um, idea of uh, universalism uh, in a good way, of history as progress, the idea that humanity goes from being hunters to herders to farmers to eventually traders and shopkeepers and, and, and intellectual scholars and so on. Um, and this idea of civilization in the 18th century um, kind of emerges as the ultimate goal of human flourishing. Um, and it's a kind of an, it is an abstract idea. In theory, in the 18th century, anyone can attain civilization if they try hard enough, essentially. Um, 
just so happens, these various European scholars who use the term first, um, first of all in France, I should say, and then in Scotland, um, uh, they, they tend to find that, that actually Europeans are best at civilization, and that actually even among Europeans, the French are really best at it, or the Scottish. Um, but, but, but still, that's just chance. It's just coincidence at that stage. And, and it also, it, it's quite useful to these people because the idea of civilization gives a sort of veneer of justification to some of the stuff that Europeans are up to overseas. So if one of the justifications of empire is that you are helping people on the path, the path towards civilization that you have quite by chance found the way to, um, albeit by taking all their stuff, that's still something you can, you can feel a bit better about it all. And you see quite a lot of that in uh, 18th century writing um, about civilization and maps, in fact. Um, 19th century, the big development is that this is the first time in the 1820s that you get the plural concept of civilizations. So civilization isn't anymore. This happens in France again. It, <laughs> I'm not getting at the French here. Uh, civilization isn't um, anymore just a single abstract thing that anyone can um, uh, aspire to attain and so on. But it's something that um, uh, can, be, can, can be said of a particular place, a particular people. There are multiple civilizations and they're different. They're different characteristics. They have different natural limits to their progress, it turns out. So over the course of the 19th century, um, quite a lot of attention is paid to ranking civilizations. And again, this is very useful for European imperialism because uh, now you don't even have to necessarily help people along the path to civilization if, unfortunately, there are some people who just can't be helped and you could just go ahead and take their stuff. And this does, I mean, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but it really does map on to uh, a much more kind of violent um, and an exploitative uh, form of Euro European um, imperialism overseas, kind of culminating in the atrocities in the Belgian Congo. It's probably the best known example. And if all of this sounds a little familiar in some ways, it's because there's another concept that is emerging at almost exactly the same time as the idea of civilizations in the plural. And that's the idea of races and human races, the idea that you can divide the human race as an abstract whole into a number of different races. And again, you can rank them. Again, they have natural limits to their progress and so on. So that's the kind of situation by the end of the 19th century. In the 20th century, the whole ranking thing goes out of fashion by the middle of the century, for probably obvious reasons. Um, but civilizations are still treated as a natural fact about the world, so that the only interesting questions become how do some do better than others, or why do they clash? And... To me, that's still a real problem. I mean, obviously, the ranking of civilizations is a problem. But I think even without the ranking, um, the idea of cultures that grow like trees, with like trees in a forest, sort of beside each other, but with their own distinct roots and branches, quite separate from those of their neighbours, is a real problem. It's something that gets in the way of properly understanding human history. Um, the civilization's model depends on the idea of these separate, large cultural blocks emerging, flourishing and declining and doing so largely alone. Never entirely alone. Nobody claims um, that, that sort of civilizations have no contact with each other. But it's actually remarkable how even today, how many scholars, writers and so on um, will, will talk about how extremely minimal and superficial those kind of contacts really are, how the story is the civilizations, not the contacts between them. And that also means that change and growth in uh, human societies, communities and so on, has to be seen as an internal development. 
that's how you get the idea that Western civilization must come from Greece and Rome, or in the early 20th century in Germany and Northern Europe, or from medieval Christendom uh, at other times. And for me, this is, this is sort of we're stuck in a 19th century way of thinking about the world. And in some ways, we've got out of this. So the idea of races, so kind of probably the most kind of um, uh, important invention of the 19th century, now debunked by genetic science. Uh, humans are all very closely related to each other. And more importantly than that, genetic groupings that you can trace in the DNA record today are very different from those of even the really quite recent past, even hundreds and thousands of years into the past, let alone hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so the scientists who've been involved in this uh, genome revolution, it's really changed the way that, that the human race kind of appears uh, to itself, um, have, have had some interesting ways of thinking about this. So David Reich, a scientist at Harvard, um, who uh, has written some most interesting stuff on genetic science, um, says that we shouldn't talk about family trees when it comes to ideas of human relationships, but trellises that connect us all to everybody else, to the extent that around about the time my own book begins uh, in the fourth, third millennium BCE, um, every single person alive in the world was a direct ancestor of every single person alive in the world today. All of you are the direct descendants of everybody who is alive when my story starts. Um, I think that's kind of quite an exciting and liberating idea, really. Um, so what I wanted to do in this book was make the case, make the same case for human culture, essentially, that civilizational thinking really misrepresents the way that humans work, that human society isn't a bunch of trees um, in a forest. It's actually it took me a while to kind of think about what it really was. I wanted another biological metaphor. I played around for quite a while with the idea of funguses or lilies is a nicer, nicer kind of image than funguses, perhaps of sort of things that kind of grow out and everything's connected to each other. And then I had a fellowship in New York uh, at the New York Public Library, where there was an, another uh, guy who, who was on a fellowship there, uh, was, uh, worked for the um, Bronx Zoo. And, and I was trying this idea out on him. And he said, no, no, you, you, you totally misunderstood this. It's what you're talking about. It's not like a, a fungus or mushrooms or something like that. It's like a bed of flowers that needs pollination every year to regrow. And I really like that metaphor. So that's why I've stuck with that human society is a bed of flowers um, in this book where distinctive local cultures come and go, of course, but they're created and sustained by interaction. So in the end, the history of what we now call the West, and in my book, that's the nations of Western Europe and their settler colonies overseas, became a case study for this bigger argument that real historical change only comes out of new connections between different people exchanging unfamiliar ideas. And that's not so unusual for most of human history. Um, there's a lot of war, for instance. That's a pretty good um, uh, forum of exchange of ideas. Um, there's a lot of trade. And I think it, it's, it's so easy to forget that in a world before container ships and online shopping and so on, even the simplest commercial transaction has to involve a meeting of minds. So that's what this book is essentially about. It's about meetings of minds. And I just thought, I don't want to take up all the time from Phil, but I thought I'd just show you a couple of examples, the kind of thing that I talk about in the book. So this, this may look a little unpromising. Um, <laughs> Uh, but this is, this is an amazing um, collection of steely, sort of men here, stone markers that spread out over the landscape of southwest Iberia, a couple of centuries either side of about 1000 BCE. This is an Atlantic world. We don't know exactly what these are. They don't, they look like gravestones in some way, but they don't seem to be 
uh, attached to individual graves. Um, and what they, they all have, uh, this, um, uh, this is a shield, with a very distinctive V-notch here. This is a shield that's very popular all along the coast of the Atlantic 3,000 years ago. People are making these shields, selling them, perfecting them all the way from um, Spain up to Ireland. Um, you also get these spears here, another very uh, standard Atlantic era um, weapon. You get swords of a kind that you find in Morocco now, as well as, as, well as again, up, up in Ireland. So there's a very um, busy set of seaways. People are paddling, of course, uh, in, in this era, paddling up and down the Atlantic seafront, exchanging ideas. And what is happening on these stone markers is that in, in the early ones, it seems like the markers themselves kind of embody an individual. So the earliest ones just have this, this um, shield, spears, maybe a sword. And, and it's as if they are the person who's wearing this, these, this armour, these weapons and so on. And they're found, the few that have been found in situ, are found kind of lying on their backs so they're not, they're not standing up, they're kind of lying on the ground. It's as if there's some maybe leader or hero or ancestor figure who's just sort of still living, lying in the landscape as you walk around it. And then sort of interesting things start to happen to them around about 1000 BCE. So you start to get things like this, which is a mirror uh, on some of them, or this, which is a chariot, um, and this is, this is uh, things have been kind of unheard of uh, in this part of the world before, but they're beginning to appear in the archaeological record at the same time. And what we're seeing here is the arrival of people from the eastern Mediterranean who have worked out how to sail all the way through the Mediterranean. Finally, it's taken them a good 2,000 years to work this out, but eventually worked out how to sail against the westerlies in the Mediterranean and... Um, and reach the far um, west and the Atlantic uh, lands. And of course, the reason they want to do that is that the Atlantic mountains are full of metals, far more than in uh, the eastern Mediterranean or Western Asia and so on. So they're coming for a purpose, which is to find metals, trade them eventually, not, not after very long, mine them. But they're bringing stuff with them that's interesting to these uh, local leaders, heroes, whatever they are, the people who are making these things. So chariots, mirrors, things about appearance, things. Chariots are very interesting because they require great skill, um, especially if horses are relatively new to the area. Um, and, but even, 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 if you, even if not, they're, still, uh, it's a way, they're a way of showing off. There's not a lot of point to a chariot, right? You can't carry very much in a chariot. Um, it, it's also, it's only good on flat ground, so you can't really use it to get around much, especially in southwest Iberia, which then if you've been to Andalusia, it's not very flat. Um, so, so chariots are something, basically, chariots are great for showing off. They're great for, sh for showing your wealth, showing your contacts, um, if you're sort of thinking about that kind of thing, then a mirror is probably pretty useful as well. The weird stuff starts, to, starts turning up. A lot of them have a human figure on. Now, we, we honestly don't know what that is. Is it the person who this is commemorating? Is it perhaps another possession of the person? Um, is it a god somehow involved in this? We just don't know. But it suggests that something is changing, not just about the goods that are coming into this area, but about ideas as well. The stone itself was, was a person, and now it's got a person on it. And then before too long, this one's broken, but, but quite a lot of them start to have these extra bits at the end here without any decoration on. And what that suggests, what that always means in other contexts, is that you're now putting them upright in the ground and using that bit to stick into the ground. And so they actually look now like the kind of stone markers that you get all around the Mediterranean, in graveyards, in sanctuaries, all sorts of things. But it's much more common in the Mediterranean, but not previously in the Atlantic, to, to, to stand things up. So again, this suggests that this is a new idea, a new idea about what these stones are, a new idea about how 
these people should kind of represent themselves, how, what's the sort of appropriate way to do these things. But at the same time, they keep this very distinctive style. There's nothing else in the Mediterranean that looks anything like uh, these, these particular markers. Um, so it's not that these people are just copying other ideas. Um, it's that they really uh, are um, using new things, partly for their own personal benefit, chariots, showing off, that kind of thing. There are some wealthy people clearly involved here. Um, but also for just sort of rethinking their kind of relationship to the landscape, to each other and so on. So that's one example. Uh, here's a very different one. This is from central Italy, about 500 years later. So about 500 BCE. Um, this is a, a crater, a wine mixing bowl. Um, it's not one of the very fancy ones. It's made out of pottery, not metal. It's about this big. Um, it's in the uh, Capitoline Museums in Rome now. Um, but this, this uh, uh, very, very, very nice um, uh, wine mixing bowl. Uh, so found in central Italy in the Etruscan area. Um, but it's got writing in Greek on it. The, the uh, painter has signed his name, Aristonathos. So it's known as the Aristonathos Crater. Um, it's also got this uh, Greek myth scene on it. So these guys here are all carrying this long stick and they're sticking it in the eye of this guy sitting down here. So this is fairly clear that this is the myth of um, Odysseus and his shipmates who uh, blind the Cyclops, Polyphemus, and his, who has this one-eyed Cyclops, and, and they blind him, and then they can, can car carry on on their travels and so on. So this looks like, on the face of it, a nice example of a pot that has been brought by some Greek trader. And this is exactly around the time that Greek traders start turning up in central Italy, um, perhaps as a present for his hosts and so on. Seems like a nice thing. They, they, they liked it well enough to keep around and eventually put in a, a grave with somebody. But actually, there's something funny going on here when you look at it a bit more closely. So the name of the artist up here, Aristonathos, it actually, this is a very, very uncommon name in Greek. And the reason that it's a very uncommon name is that it translates as best bastard. So... <laughs> I mean, maybe it's a nickname, maybe it's a joke, but it's a bit strange. Um, and then you sort of look at the scene here. And the thing is, this is, you know, absolutely the story as it's told in Greek epic and so on. Except that Polyphemus here is basically the same size as the sailors. He's not a giant, whereas it's very important in the Greek story that he's a giant. This doesn't seem like a necessarily hugely important detail, but it is quite a striking detail in the story we're familiar with. So it's been changed. We think, well, why has it been changed? We also know, not from this pot, but from other evidence, that the people in Etruria have an idea of Odysseus, the Greek hero, but they call him Utusa. They have a different name for him. Like the um, uh, Latins call him Ulysses. The uh, people in Etruria call him uh, Utusa. And unlike the Latins, they give him a whole set of other adventures. So he keeps all his adventures that he has in the Greek myths. But then uh, the idea is after that story's finished, Odysseus comes back to Italy. And he wanders around, he has other adventures, he founds various peoples, and eventually he founds the city of Cortona and dies there. And this is kind of a really very little known story, but, but it seems like that's most likely the story that's being commemorated on this pot. And probably it's being painted by somebody who is not in fact themselves Greek or a Greek speaker, but is sort of playing with the idea of this is a Greek kind of pot. And for me, what I love about this example is that it shows not just the transmission of goods, or more likely, I think, ideas, but also stories. That stories kind of wrap the Mediterranean around. And people are exchanging stories, sometimes traders, sometimes soldiers, often enslaved people, often um, servants, and people are, 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 are constantly telling stories, and they're always changing. And that's something that carries on 
through the whole um, uh, of my book right up into the Arabic period when uh, Europe is uh, uh, kind of fascinated in the medieval period by Arabic, um, what kind of seem now often like fairy stories, um, but are, are, are hugely influential. Anyway, I think, I was going to show you one last thing since I'm talking about the Arabic period. Um, so this is the, the map on the cover um, of my book. Um, and this, uh, I love this map. Um, so this is a map made by a North African scholar, North African Islamic Arabic speaking scholar called Muhammad al-Adrisi in the middle of the 12th century CE. And he worked for Roger II of Sicily, who was one of the first Christian kings after the kind of conquest or reconquest, depending on how you look at it, of um, southern Europe by, uh, by Christians. But Roger II was not a very um, uh, resetizing Christian. And um, he, uh, he em employed scholars, poets, all sorts of people from all sorts of language traditions. He was very interested in poetry um, in particular, but he was also interested in scholarship. And Arabic was the language of scholarship across the Mediterranean um, in this period. So he employed this guy, uh, Muhammad al Adrisi. To do this, he came with a whole team, a whole research team, a lab. Um, uh, they read all the important books on geography, most of them in that era written by Arabic scholars. That was the most sophisticated, up-to-date mapping traditions. But equally, um, there's a couple of uh, Latin books that they look at, and there's a, a, a Greek scholar they're very interested in as well. And we know this because he writes a whole book about how he wrote the atlas that he produced for Roger II. And it's fascinating. It's like a kind of scientific research article, but, but much jollier because he's very judgmental. Um, <laughs> and, and what he did with his team was produce this atlas of the whole world, dividing it up into 70 uh, regions. So um, seven kind of rows, north to south, and then 10 chunks, 10, 10, 10 columns across. And for each region, he produces a little map um, and a description of that place, either from uh, reports or very often from people he's actually sent out to explore these places and so on. And then he also produces this, which in the original was a silver disc. It was a map of the whole world on a silver disc. It was one of the great wonders of medieval Sicily. Unfortunately, it was... Uh, burnt and sort of melted down in a revolt of the barons after the death of Roger II. So all we have left now are these manuscript copies of it. But as well as being incredibly beautiful, I think they, they suggest such an interestingly different way of seeing the world. So this map is oriented to the south. Um, this is... Let me just put it on here. So this is Europe here. This is North Africa. This is the Nile. There are some mistakes, too. This, this is following, actually, a, a Roman idea that the Nile actually goes out to the Atlantic on the other side. Um, this is Asia. Um, this is the east coast of Africa. So there's, there's not... A, up to about here, there's a good idea of, of, of the geography. South of that, still not, not very well developed. Um, uh, Arabic labels of course, because this is the language of scholarship, very much supported by Roger II. Um, and, and you can see how the edges of this world are kind of foreshortened by access and experience. So the centre of the world is the Levant, Ar Arabia and Egypt. And this has been true for 3,000 years by this stage, maybe 4,000 years. This is where the most things are happening, where the most kind of connections are being made. And as you get further out, things get smaller. So Scandinavia is really not very big compared to Italy here. Spain's quite small still. You can't really tell which one Britain is out on the edge, one of these islands down here. Um, but a lot of detail on North African cities and on Asian routes and cities uh, and so on. And so that's really the world as it appeared um, in the medieval period, you can also see the importance of rivers, various of rivers, all these things here that look like umbrellas. They're actually rivers going up to <laughs> mountains, the, the sources, mountains themselves, 
um, and the seas. Even though the Mediterranean is shown at the same size as the Indian Ocean, again, that's a sort of foreshortening on the edges. Um, but the sense that actually what you want to know about the world is how to get around it. What's going to help you, the seas and the rivers? What's going to get in your way, like the mountains? Um, and the last thing I want to say about this map is um, these lines on it here and here and here. This is a way of thinking about, these are called climes. They're by dividing the world from north to south. So basically dividing it by climate zone, which is quite a sensible, useful way of dividing the world. And this is an absolutely standard way of dividing the world from the ancient Greek period onwards, all the way through um, the Islamic period, right up to uh, around about 1400, 1500 CE. Um, and, and what I love about it is that I think we've got such a strong sense now of East and West as being the two big blocks in the world. And that, again, is a completely new idea that all the way through from classical antiquity from, and before that, through the kind of medieval science, especially in the Arabic world, what was really interesting to people was North and South. Um, and, and, you know, uh, that, that is, I think, actually a more... Um, sensible way uh, of, of thinking about the way that the world is divided. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take that as my sign <laughs> to finish there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, now, <clears throat> I have a very quiet voice. Can you hear me at the, at the back? Good. Um, the first thing I want to say is this is an absolutely terrific book. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, you will have a chance to buy it at the end, and we have something to say about, about uh, a particular offer we're going to make on that. But what I wanted to say to start with is this is an extraordinary achievement. Um, it's not quite as terrifyingly long as you <coughs> might at first think. It's um, only 415 pages. Has quite a lot of notes. I'd just like to say very useful index. I designed it especially. There are thirty chapters, and each chapter should take about one cup of tea or one glass of wine to read. So. Now this is, um, um, I mean, that's a very self-deprecating way of talking about a book which is beautifully written and hugely entertaining to read. And I'm not going to embarrass Joe by reading out what Rory Stewart, Lucy Worsley, Peter Frankopan and William Dalrymple all had to say about it. But you can assume that it was positive. <laughs> um, but what I am going to do is pick up on a couple of reviews that have already appeared. Um, I mean, this um, the thing about this book is that it... It's basically taking apart the idea of civilization um, and civilizations that we might have had and giving us something really interesting in its place. Um, rather than just demolishing, it, it's putting something there. And um, the Guardian's um, review, via a regular reviewer called um, Stephen Poole, was very positive. The book is rich in marvelous detail and succeeds in making the pre-classical world come to life. And there are plenty of other passages like that in the review. And um, the, the FT um, review by Tristram Hunt, who is the director of the VNA, called it an impressive display of rigorous scholarship, lightly worn, successfully covering a huge amount of material. So you, this is a um, when the reviews of the, the book came out, and there's another one in the Times... Um, and a very good one in the Irish Times, really good reviewing media. Everybody recognises this is a, an important book. So the first question I want to ask you, Joe, is how did you get started as a, uh, as a classicist? Um, 
<laughs> there's at least one person in the audience who was around at the time. Um, uh, I um, went to a school, so I went to a state school um, in uh, the Midlands, in Nottingham, um, and uh, uh, it was a Catholic school. So in those days, though sadly no longer, um, you could do Latin there. And so, um, so I was really excited to start uh, doing Latin because I love languages and so I didn't really know what it was. Um, so I did Latin for a couple of years um, and then, uh, but I didn't really want to be, I, I also was interested in economics and that kind of thing. I wasn't even particularly interested in history at that time. Um, I was interested in different things that had languages like maths and, and modern languages, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, I got some birthday money um, from my grandmother and, uh, and the um, biography of Oscar Wilde um, had just come out. The really, um, this was back in the uh, 1980s. Um, uh, I'm not going to remember the name of the author Elman. now. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Elman's uh, biography. And, uh, and I was fascinated to discover in this biography that you could actually go to university and study Latin and Greek as well, which had never occurred to me. That seems a very odd thing to do. But Oscar Wilde had done this and uh, had got to travel around Greece. Um, and then, you know, he had a remarkable career as a sort of outrageous character. And uh, I thought this sounded like fun. So I thought I'd like to become a classicist. <laughs> um, and it wasn't a very easy ride because uh, the teacher who had been teaching Latin in my school um, had a nervous breakdown shortly after I started my A-levels. Um, I don't think the two were related. Um, but uh, uh, so I, I basically um, taught myself um, after GCSE um, and I, I, didn't, I didn't do Greek until I got to university. But, uh, but I very much came into it uh, sort of from the side. But I didn't, it, it wasn't something that to me had a kind of history or heritage. It was just this really weird thing you could do at university and why not? <laughs> and then you found you enjoyed it and you carried on. Yeah, and this also took me back to history, which um, I hadn't much enjoyed at GCSE. Again, Nottingham, but it was the first uh, year or two of GCSEs and there was a really big focus on empathy and on local history um, which of course empathy is very important local history was very interesting but they were still kind of calibrating how GCSEs worked and so basically we spent two years writing essays about what it felt like to be a Ruddington framework knitter <laughs> and I, I, I you know I didn't really want to carry on doing that for the rest of my life but when I started doing classics at uh, at university there was this strand to it which was ancient history and I realized that was a kind of back door back into history and so I, I basically became after my first year pretty much a uh, paid up historian right now <clears throat> um, in the FT review the um, Tristram Hunt quotes quite a few passages from the book, and I'm not going to read them all out, but um, he's obviously intrigued by what you're doing, although he has some misgivings later on. We'll come back to that. But he does say, um, among Quinn's achievements in her use of advanced discoveries in DNA to scuttle dearly held um, civilizational myths, the idea of a separate Etruscan race in the 9th century is shot down by evidence of their genetic profile being very similar to that of their Italian neighbours. Um, what I'd like you to do next, Joe, if you would, is if you move the uh, use the clicker and go to the picture of that amazing disc, which I think is oh, uh, uh, this, forwards. Rather. Oh, the caravel. Oops, sorry, this one, yeah. Uh, it wasn't... Oh, uh, I thought it was... Okay, there is... I that was one of the oh ones. no, that's not one of the okay. ones on there. Sorry. In, I'm going to hold this up then because this is this is. Um, can the you Nebra see disc. this beautiful disc? <laughs> and would you tell us about it and also what the um, the carbon dating and uh, um, the analysis, um, the isotope analysis of the metals involved? Oh, well, this is this, this is absolutely gorgeous, basically a copper disc um, that was discovered at Nebra in northern Germany um, uh, in 1999, I read here in my helpful caption. Um, uh, and, um, and what it is, is um, uh, the green is the copper that's gone green, 
And then there's a sort of what look at least like um, a moon and a sun here and some kind of other sort of semicircle at the bottom and then various dots. And, and what this almost certainly is, um, though of course we can't go and ask people, uh, is, is the depiction of the sky at night. This is an astronomical um, uh, image. Um, lots of different theories about exactly what kind of astronomical image. But what, what really interested me about this is that there was a lot of this debate for a long time about when exactly it dated to. It was clearly very, very old. But was it you know, 2,000 years old, 3,000, 4,000. So eventually it was properly carbon dated, among other things, uh, uh, to 1600 uh, BCE. By, the thing itself is not made of anything wood. It can't be carbon dated. But the things it was found with in the same buried together with uh, could be carbon dated. So 1600 BCE, which is, you know, this is before the Mycenaeans in Greece. This is before... Um, uh, you know, almost any kind of European civilizations in, in inverted commas that anyone's um, heard of. Um, and so, I mean, one thing here that is going on is clearly this very interesting world of ideas among the people who make this and either around Nebra or sell it or bring it or give it um, to the people in Nebra. Um, there are connections with Scandinavian rock carvings. So the um, uh, semicircle at the bottom um, may well be the sort of boat that carries the sun in a lot of Scandinavian rock carvings. And that's talking several hundred miles away. So it's kind of already interesting. Maybe ideas are travelling that far. But what's really um, completely fascinating is that the, really the most recent evidence is on the isotopes particularly the lead isotopes um, in uh, this artefact. And what it shows is that the copper is from the Alps. So again, several hundred miles away in a different direction from, from Scandinavia. So another interesting thing that at least the raw materials for this have been brought a long way or it was made a long way away and then brought um, as a manufactured um, good. But the tin and the early gold that some... Um, that, that, that is also used of decoration of this actually comes from Britain. And now we're talking thousands of miles away. We're talking 1600 BCE, more than three and a half thousand years ago. People are exchanging heavy metals. So things that, you know, you can't just sort of carry in your pocket or take on a, a single canoe. It's, it's a big um, uh, a sort of uh, major trading operations are needed to transport metals around Europe. Um, and they're transporting them all the way, in some cases, from Cornwall and Wales, possibly even from Ireland, that hasn't been confirmed, but certainly from Cornwall and Wales, um, all the way probably down the Thames, across the Channel, and then down the uh, European river system into Germany and, and to the Alps as well. And, and I, I suppose one of the kind of civilizational myths that I'm interested in puncturing in this book is the idea that to the extent that there's any sort of influence on Europe, it all goes in one direction, that history kind of moves from the east to the west and sort of culminates in, in Western Europe. And I was so interested in examples like this, where you can see things coming from the north and the west, actually south and east, um, and, and sort of constituting the sort of a shared European past and, and shared stories and so on. So that's the... Thank you. Now, I have... About three more questions, which I'm not going to ask because we are now at quarter past eight and we want to give our audience a chance to ask their own questions. But I'm just going to throw these headings out. Um, there's a great chapter on Palmyra, which n not many of us can go to see today because of what's happened in Syria. Um, but um, Petra and the Nabataeans was one. The House of Wisdom was another. Um, the role of Arabic scientists and translators, which included preserving a lot of texts that might otherwise have been lost from particularly Greek literature. And then the whole, the whole question about how you, how you rethink your world view when, when it's being <clears throat> so engagingly dismantled. So 
those were my thoughts, but we've got a roving mic somewhere. I can't quite see. Oh, there we are. And questions, yes. Hi, uh, Joan Bill. <coughs> Joe was talking about <coughs> uh, things coming together from a great distance. Recently I've read about the coincidence, an amazing coincidence of the story of the three fates. I believe in Viking, in Norse, it's called Noros. And of course in Greek you have Lachesis and Atropos and it, exactly the same story about weaving, mm. spinning and then Atropos cutting the thread about the fate of man ending up with his demise. Mm. Um, how do you think this incredible coincidence came about, Joe? Well, I mean, so, OK, one possibility is it could just be a coincidence. I mean, there are in... I have to sort of preface any other comments by saying there are plenty of examples in the study of myth where stories that seem extremely similar are found in parts of the world that simply cannot have had any connection with each other. You know, South America and, um, you know, uh, Central Europe, that kind of thing. Um, so sometimes a coincidence is just a coincidence. However, um, one of the things that I really enjoyed with this book was tracing the connections between Northern Europe and the Mediterranean. And there are so many of them. So a story like that, it could go back to the Bronze Age when we know that razors... So there's a great fashion in Greece around three and a half thousand years ago for razors. It's part of the same idea. They like mirrors and that kind of thing. Um, so lots of razors. And suddenly razors start turning up in Scandinavia. Now, probably they're not being carried by a single person. They're kind of, you know, being traded up and down the rivers and so on. But there's an idea, not just... I mean, people know what to do with them. There's a fashion that's actually spreading a long way. So it seems very likely that stories are being told by the same sorts of people who are showing each other how to shave um, with these new razors. Uh, so that's, that's one um, time period. Um, and then you've got, you know, the period of the Vikings... Um, later, so that, that won't work for a story that's also told by the ancient Greeks, but later you get stories that are coming from Scandinavia and to Scandinavia, from Ireland, from Baghdad and so on. So stories go an immensely long way. There's an amazing story, and this is again a later um, version of this, uh, which originates in India around about um, to the year zero, um, but it's, a, it's the story of the Buddha. Um, and this story, it carries on being told in India as the story of the Buddha, sort of bi biography of the Buddha. Um, but as it travels to other places, it kind of changes. So it gets translated into Persian, and then it gets translated into Arabic, and then it gets translated into Georgian. And by the time it's been translated into Georgian, the Buddha has become a Christian, and he's a Christian convert who's upsetting his father because his father doesn't want him to be a Christian. And then from there, it goes from Georgian into Latin and Greek and Hebrew and Old Norse by the 13th century. So that's one that kind of goes all the way from India to Scandinavia later. So it's absolutely plausible. So it's that, all oral. Yeah, yes, yes, almost. Right. That, that there are cultures where people do write down these kinds of stories, but it's actually quite mostly in Western Asia. Otherwise, it seems to be oral. Yeah. yeah. Question in the front here. Um, thanks for, for coming tonight and telling us about your book. Um, can I ask you, there's a, there's a site in southern Turkey, um, I won't be able to pronounce it, Gobekli Tepe, oh, which yeah, was Tepe, a very yeah. advanced community and yeah. then was suddenly buried for an unknown reason all before Christ sort of thing. Yeah. I was wondering, were you able to cover that in your book or do you have any comments on it? Yes, I can absolutely comment on it. There was one of the things, I spent about three weeks writing about Gobekli Tepe at the beginning because I was so interested in it. And in the end, when, I mean, it's already quite a big book, I had to cut so much. So it's not actually in the book, but there is, there's a footnote about it, which gives some more bibliography if people are interested. There's an absolutely fascinating site because it's, this is a site in the kind of hills of southern Turkey and sort of northern Syria, southern Turkey kind of border region. Um, and it's a gathering place. It's a place where people came from neighbouring communities, not very far away, because actually now they've discovered about another 15 places just like it, all in the same 
large region. But probably people are coming from, you know, maybe 100 miles um, around there. There's no evidence for housing or anything like that. It's somewhere people come for festivals, basically. And it has the most extraordinary sculptures. If you have a chance to visit it, it's so worth it. It's absolutely incredible. These sort of, they look a bit like totem poles, um, all sorts of fantastical animals, um, quite pornographic in some ways. Um, but uh, people are having a lot of fun with these things. And, and these pillars are somehow holding up uh, the coverings of these sort of rooms that are maybe being used for the parties. And absolutely, once they've sort of been used, they're then covered up. Um, and, and nobody really knows what's going on there. All sorts of interesting things about food ways and so on, scientists, scientists can find out there. Um, but what's really fascinating is that this is all going on before the invention of agriculture. It's just on the cusp of it. It's like within about a thousand years, people will be farming and so on, but they're not doing it yet. And so this is an incredibly, I mean, it's a sophisticated culture where our evidence is that they throw really great parties. <laughs> uh, but that, yeah, I love that. That's kind of our best idea of how sophisticated what are essentially hunter-gatherer cultures um, could be. Uh, so, so yeah, no, it's, it's a really wonderful site and I do... I recommend, you know, Googling it, and, and if you ever have a chance to go there, I really recommend it. Another question? Right. Oh, I can see we've got one online at, at, at the back. Thanks, Emma. Hi, this is from Pat, who's watching online. She says, in the light of mixed cultures, so changing the way we look at civilizations, could, does that change the way we look at the urge to return artifacts to places that they were made? Oh. Oh, thanks, Pat. That's a great question. Um, I think... I think the question about returning, repatriating, if you like, artefacts is always a question about the present day, really. Um, it's, it can be put in a very historical way, but it's actually a question about morals in the present day, morals and practicalities. Um, and you can tell that because very often you're not talking about returning something to a place it was actually made. There's a great example at the moment of the Libyan government have made a request to the Queen, oh, sorry, I guess the King now, they made a request to the Queen a couple of years ago, um, to return some uh, marbles from uh, temples in Lepkis Magna on the coast of what's now Libya that were taken by the British in the early 19th century and used eventually to build an enormous folly in Windsor Great Park. You can go and visit. It's at Virginia Water, if, I'm, uh, <laughs> if you know the train system of, of that part of the world. Um, and, and what's so fascinating about this request, which I have to say the Queen did not find time to get round to before she um, uh, passed on. Um, uh, and I don't think it's a high priority right now either. But what was so interesting about it was that the artefacts themselves were made out of marble that had basically been stolen by the Romans from Turkey and from Greece and so on brought to North Africa, quite possibly worked by enslaved labour and so on. Um, and, and you kind of get into these interesting questions about how do you choose where something is actually going to? Um, what city does something really come from? So it's nothing in antiquity comes from a modern country like Greece or wherever it might be. Where are you actually uh, returning something to? And I think all of these things are very present questions so I don't actually think, I'm sorry to say, that my book is, is enormously helpful on this topic because I think that modern politics is our best guide to what to do in these situations. Right. Yes, we have no, another, another one. Here, just to be <laughs> another one a little bit more um, debatable. Do you place any kind of credence could, at all? In could you use the microphone, please? Theory? Could you use the microphone so it's properly recorded? Thank you. Sorry, i um, throwing a bit of a curveball here, just to be mix it up a little bit. Do you place any credence at all in the ancient um, astronaut theory that's been handed down from Eric von Deineken? Mm. Because it's caused a, an enormous amount of um, debate. Mm. 
it's really caused no debate at all among archaeologists and historians. We are absolutely united in knowing that it's rubbish, um, unfortunately, because it would be brilliant. It'd be so much fun if it was true. Um, but unfortunately, it's absolutely not true. There's no evidence for any kind of ex external, let's say, um, uh, visits to Earth. And unfortunately, the sort of slightly sad part of it is that it's a way of retelling a story about incredibly sophisticated ancient monuments. Some of it's just completely made up, whether you know, invent yeah. pyramids in Indonesia and so on. There's just been a, a particular article has just been retracted. Um, but but usually what it is is saying, you know, something like, oh, well, you know, the pyramids are just too sophisticated. That couldn't have been done by you know, relatively primitive ancient peoples. Sometimes that's about particular ancient peoples. Often I think it's just about an idea that people in antiquity were a bit more stupid than we are now. I mean, that's something I come across quite a lot, even, even in, among students and so on, this idea that somehow we're cleverer than people used to be. But it's sort of sad because, you know, many, many, many archaeologists and historians have shown exactly how things like the pyramids were built. And it's basic... Uh, mechanics. It's, it's not, it's not, I mean, it's hard, it's clever, it's sophisticated, but it's not, um, you know, uh, it's not from up there. It's just, you know, clever people think hard about a problem and work out how to solve it. And, uh, and they do. And so I, I, it makes me a little bit sad, the ancient astronauts theories, even though I can also see that they're fun. Um, because I just think ancient humans are really amazing and, and we should give them more credit. Yeah. <laughs> We have one quick question and one brief answer. Okay, the lady yes. In the front. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, I just wondered how wide you'd gone. You've talked about basically the Mediterranean, mm. Europe and that circle. And I, then you've just mentioned India once. Yeah. And I just wonder, there's obviously the whole world to play with. Yeah. And I wonder is that, I don't know how wide you go in the book, because I haven't read it, but I also wonder if you don't go that wide or if that's because what you have, your expertise and what's mm. manageable or whether it's what you think the real limits of connections are. Uh, all three. So it's an old world book. So I finished around 1500. So the very last chapter deals with people arriving in the Caribbean from European countries and so on. So I don't deal with connections with the Americas um, uh, other than those ones that come right at the end of the book. So that, that's the bit about I don't... I mean, I may be proved wrong. I'm having coffee with a guy and a colleague in New York in a few weeks who has a new theory about canoes across the Pacific and, you know, that'll be very exciting. But for now, uh, it's an old world book. Um, it... it so the way that I decided on the limits of it was that I put myself in Western Europe. Oh, that's where I'm from. That's what the book's about. And I basically traced out the connections. So it gets bigger as the book goes on. So India turns up um, around about the last centuries BCE when people in Egypt start trading with India. Um, China turns up, actually not much later, around the early century CE, um, when, when people in China are trading with India and that's then coming back, um, goods and so on, sometimes ideas are coming back to Western Europe. So it does go out to the edges, it goes down to Zimbabwe in terms of the Indian Ocean and so on, um, out to Ireland, Scandinavia and the other directions. So, so it's sort of, tr it, the limits follow those connections, essentially. And what this was quite luckily for me this meant that there's more stuff that's in my own area of expertise which is you know, the western mediterranean and north africa largely um but but i was able to explore um uh kind of places further and further afield as i went along thank you and i'm afraid that brings us to the end but before i hand back to julie um julie bell our chair of litfest <clears throat> i just want to say this is an extraordinary book um, I haven't yet quite got to the end of it, but um, I'm, one of the things I'm looking forward to after the, the, the enjoyable mayhem of Litfest is actually being able to sit down and read a book. <laughs> but you can buy this book afterwards, and it, it, is, um, it won't surprise you to hear that it's £30. It's a very big, fat book and quite expensive. There are 30 maps. There are 30 <laughs> maps and there is 16 pages of beautiful illustrations. So you really, it's a really terrific book. Now I noticed that on Amazon it's selling for £22 something. But Outrageous. Postage takes, it to, postage takes it up to £26.50. 
but only tonight you can buy it from Lipfest and support us for £25. We have copies outside. And now I'm going to hand back to Julie to do the thank yous. Can I just say thank you, a huge thank you to Jo. Um, I think it's been an extremely enjoyable um, talk tonight and thank you so much. And you've obviously got plenty of people in the audience that were very engaged with what you had to say and hopefully we'll read the book. So can we give a big round of applause please to Jo <laughs> for... Thank you. And I know she's got to jet off fairly quickly afterwards, but I'm sure you'll be around for a short, short time. Before oh, yes. No, yeah. I can sign some books. And Brilliant. More Thank you. Yeah. So the very last thing I need to say to you is if you want to hear more wonderful authors like Jo Quinn, you need to support Litfest. The event tonight is um, has been free because we want to make these events as accessible as possible, and we've taken that on board over the last two years. But if you would like to donate, people will be outside with a donate bucket. And um, you can become a friend of LitFest so that you can support us all year round because we are an all year round festival now. These are our two key points in the spring and the autumn. Um, the average price of one of our tickets will be five pounds, but just give what you can and just help us to keep bringing wonderful people like Joe to Lancaster. We are the third oldest festival. I'd like to tell everybody that in the country. The third oldest literature festival and we need to keep promoting it. I'd like us to celebrate our 50th anniversary, never mind our 45th. So um, please do what you can. Thank you so much for your support and hopefully we'll see you at the rest of the events in the weekend. Thank you.